بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليم كثيرا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العظيم الحمد لله all praise be to Allah subhanahu wa taala we've now reached about halfway through the noble month of Ramadan that uh, the month of patience and we only have a, another half left so inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us tawfiq as he's given us tawfiq to fast the first part of the month to continue fasting till the end of the month and inshallah any type of jabr any type of repair or uh, making up of things that we missed out on in the first 15 months of uh, first 15 days of this noble month inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to rectify that in these last uh, two weeks uh, that we should renew our himma and renew our aspirations and renew our intentions and renew our uh, desire to benefit from this month in all of its different ways of benefiting inwardly and outwardly because this month is an extremely, extremely, extremely important month. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to do that and to do what we can to give Ramadan its haq and its right, although in reality that we never will ultimately give Ramadan its haq and its right. But we can try and hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter the musi'een and the people who continually are doing uh, are shortcomers in fi barakat al uh, in the barakah of the people of Ihsan and spiritual realization. And they mention in terms of Hajj, there was one time a story of a man that he was making Hajj and he fell asleep and he saw a dream. And he, in his dream uh, that he was told that only six people who made pilgrimage that year was, were accepted. The pilgrimage was accepted from them. And he woke up like, La ilaha illallah. Like there was supposedly in this year, uh, that there was uh, 600,000 people that made Hajj. And he woke up in a state of qalaq and he was disturbed by this. And then he fell asleep again and he saw in a dream uh, that someone told him and from the, the mercy of Allah that he accepted for every one of the six, 100,000. Right? So that it was accepted from <laughs> all the people there that made Hajj. And this is the Barakat al-Ilkhal al-Musi'een fi Barakat al-Muhsineen The entering of the uh, people of Musi'een into the Barakah of the people of Ihsan in spiritual excellence And so hopefully just as it happened in Hajj, it also happen in Ramadan So uh, there was a question that a brother had sent by email, I don't see the brother here uh, but uh, maybe we can just postpone that. It was related to that, the hadith that we mentioned uh, last week uh, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the one that if Allah ta'ala gives someone uh, good character, uh, that never shall God make good the character and created form of a man and then allow him to be devoured by hell. Uh, that he had a question uh, related to this. And um, it doesn't mean that everyone. Uh, th there's a proper understanding to it. It doesn't mean that if someone doesn't have uh, one of those two, that he's not going to go to paradise. And what it means, and it doesn't mean that it's unconditional. It means that there is conditions to that, obviously, of them being iman, first and foremost. And so it's just a special thing that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, and, and without doubt there's a secret behind <coughs> why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this to be the case and someone has a good physical stature and good character, that he'll prevent that individual from the fire. And, and perhaps it's related to 
the beauty that is manifesting because any <coughs> attribute of beauty that you see in creation is ultimately a manifestation of one of the beautiful attributes of Allah in God and so that if God manifests these beautiful attributes on an individual inwardly and outwardly and it's a sign that he's going to manifest those beautiful attributes on this individual in the akhirah as well and it also doesn't mean that the, there was people that uh, might not have a very pleasant look to them but they could be from the in the a'la illiyin and be of the highest ranks it's not just because of the way that someone looks that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that they're not going to be close to Allah because in reality your your physical stature you, you don't have any control over that right? it's not going to determine you know your rank with your Lord and this is why one time uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who was extremely short that they say like two arm lengths right and which is like a meter high so like two arm lengths high and he was very skinny and he was a shepherd and he's the one that when he came to the uh, the head of Abu Jahl that he was so small that he swung with the sword he couldn't even cut the head of Abu Jahl off it stopped right and so Abu Jahl said no cut my head here right so that when you bring it to Muhammad that he'll see my head is, is big and then um, yeah, one time he was climbing a tree and some of the companions were laughing at him and how skinny his legs were right and then Allah, the Prophet said, said that those legs are weightier than Allah than the mountain of Uhud Right? And so it's not about physical stature in reality, it's about uh, one's rank with their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and so that, that just uh, what needed to be uh, clarified in relation to that. And he also had a question about the Ashur and Mubashir in Bil Jannah. Does that mean that they will enter into paradise without going to uh, the fire? And of course, the Ashur and Mubashir in Bil Jannah are, they'll be, you know, they will enter into paradise. Uh, without even going into the fire and that um, along with a number of other people and matter of fact that there's 70,000 people from the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu right that will enter into paradise without hisab without even reckon, reckoning that they'll enter without even reckoning and then the Prophet Sallallahu out of his concern for his Ummah kept uh, imploring his Lord and Allah Ta'ala gave him for every one of the 70,000, another 70,000. So 70,000 times 70,000. Right? Allahu Akbar. That's a lot of people. Without hisab, without reckoning. Meaning, while well, everyone else is on the plane and uh, having to deal with everything that they put forth in this world, that these people are going to... Right? Without even having to be there for the reckoning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make us be from them insha'Allah. So we finished last week uh, talking about the, uh, the ah different ahadith of the exp exposition of the merit which is in having good character or in co any condemnation of bad character. And we reached the narratives which is how it's been uh, Sidi Abdul Hakim Murad has chose to translate it at Athar. And we'll try to get through this chapter in this and then the following chapter. Now this chapter is somewhat technical and so we'll try to limit the commentary and just try to get through it because it's a, uh, somewhat long and then the point of this chapter is to give us an understanding about what is good character. When we talk about good character, how do you define good character? What is the reality of good character? Right? What are the fruits of good character? How can we determine the difference between the reality and the fruit? And to give us a basic understanding of all these specific attributes that are going to be late, mentioned to us later on. Because the way Imam Ghazali does this, this being the third quarter, the Ihya having four quarters as we previously mentioned, that he gave in the first chapter about the wonders of the heart, just talking about the heart and what is this heart of the individual. What is this inner aspect of the individual that we're going to be dealing with? And then he gives, an, in this book that we're studying, about disciplining the soul, these, disciplining the soul basic principles. And then, what he's going to do after making that clear is just talk briefly about the, the, two, the Kasr al-Shahwatayn, the two different uh, desires that, the, in breaking them. And then he gets into specifics about particular vices. Right, beginning with tahalli, right, and ridding yourself 
from uh, things that are not pleasing to Allah. And then in the second and the last quarter with tahalli. And I'm about mentioning to you all these beautiful things that the human being is uh, supposed to uh, adorn himself with. And there's an indication of tahalli and tahalli uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah la yughayru ma bikum and hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah Ta'ala won't change the condition of people until they change the condition of themselves. Right? Meaning that there's tahalli and tahalli. Allah won't change their condition, right? And put them and give them yuhallihim and adorn them with beautiful characteristics until they what? Change their own condition. Right? And changing your own condition is tahalli. It's getting rid of the bad things that are holding you down. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving you the other things is to and, and giving you the adorning you with the beautiful aspects. And so the narratives. He mentions here, uh, Lukman the wise once asked his father, Father, what is the finest single trait in a man? Religion, he replied. Then he asked, And what are the finest two traits? Religion and wealth, said he. And finest three. Religion, wealth, and modesty. And if there should be four, religion, wealth, modesty, and good character. And if there should be five, he, and he replied, religion, wealth, modesty, good character, and generosity. And if there should be six, oh my son, he replied, <laughs> when these five traits come together in a man, then he is pious, he's taqi, and pure, naqi, one of God's servants, lillahi wali. And is quit of shaitan. Well, man is shaitan, buddy. Right? Shaitan will have no power over the individual if he has these attributes. And Hassan said, A man of bad character punishes his own soul, meaning he will at'abaha, punishes his own soul that he'll tire his own soul out. Right? If someone has bad character, he's only harming himself. Right? And that's the, that's the thing about the hasud. Al hasud la yasud. The person of envy right, will never rise. And, and the thing is, is that if you, have, <laughs> if you have envy towards someone, what envy is, is you want that blessing to remove from him. But what you don't realize is, is that by you having that envy, right, you're not affecting the situation in any way. Right? You're not preventing him from getting that ni'mah. Rather, what, by you having envy, he's getting your hasanat. Right? So you, you're the, the hasud right, is only harming his own soul, right, that he, one, is harming his own soul in terms of he's not allowing himself to spiritually rise, but two, that very thing that he wants to be removed from that individual, that person's going to be increased, <laughs> so he's not going to, he's, it's not going to benefit him in any way. And it's been Madik said, a bondsman can reach the very highest rank in heaven through his good character without being a man of much worship and can reach the lowest region of the inferno of Jahannam through his bad character even though he should worship abundantly. As we, this is a hadith with a similar meaning that was related previously in last week. Said Yahya ibn Mu'adh, in an expansive character lie the treasures of provision. SubhanAllah, show for the way of the people of Busira in inner sight. Uh, Busira is more important than the Basr. The Basr is our physical sight and the Busira is our inner sight as he's going to talk about in the next chapter. And our inner sight is more important than our physical sight. And that uh, our inner sight is, is what enables us to perceive realities. Our inner sight is what enables us to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Our inner sight is more important because someone could have no, he could be blind outwardly, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened his heart. And so that he sees with his heart. But if someone's blind in their heart, then they appear like they're seeing, but they don't see. Right? What does Allah say? Right? That it's not the eyes that go blind. Rather, it's the heart that are in the breast. Right? It's the kulub al is sudur. The hearts are the reality of being blind. And Allah Ta'ala didn't give us outwardly that understanding of what it means to be blind in order to explain to us on a, on a deeper level in a figurative spiritual way about what true blindness is. And so he said, in an expansive character lie the treasures of provision, meaning he was seeing the correlation between being expansive. One of the names of Allah is Al Wasi, the vast. 
the expansive. And so what he's saying here is you can be expansive in terms of your wealth, right? You can have tahallak bi akhlaqillah in this instance that it's one of the sunnas for the instance the day of Eid on the day of Muharram and other days during the year that you're extremely generous to your family and to your children, right? At-tawsi' ala al-iyal that at-tawsi' is the second form wasa'a yuwasi'u tawsi'a is to make things vast, literally but how do you make things vast is right, other times of the year oh, you know, we just can't do it we have to save our money, we have to think about our future but on those days, let, let the reins loose a little bit right? give them what they want, your child asks you for something give him what he wants, take him out be extra, uh, have extra generosity on those days. And you can also be expansive in terms of your character, right? That uh, expansive in terms of your character, even if you don't have money, right? As that previous hadith that we took last week, that you can, ha by having good character and not being stingy with your own character, that you can encompass other people. And what he's saying here is, is that in an expansive character lie the treasures of provision, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide generously for the person who is by his nature generous. God will provide generously for that person because of his doing that, this was what the result is. If you're generous with your character and with your wealth, Allah will be generous with you. If you're stingy with your character and your wealth, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we won't use the word stingy, right, but he'll yaqbid, he's al-qabid and al-basit. Right? He is the one who, uh, the, the qabid, the one who contracts, and he's the basit. He's the one who uh, expands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Wahhab ibn Munabbah said, <coughs> the man of bad character <laughs> is like a piece of broken pottery, which can neither be patched up nor returned to clay. Just imagine the pot just, right? No way you're going to get that pot back to put back to back together, and and then and that that clay that's already baked, right? You're not going to get it back to dirt in its original form. That's the likeness of someone who has bad character. Al Fudail ibn Iyad said, "The company of an irreligious man of good character is preferable to me than that of an ill-natured man much given to worship." Subhanallah, show his fiqh and his understanding. He'd rather be in the presence of someone who has good character, even if he doesn't have much worship, than someone who's an abid and worships Allah a lot, but doesn't have good character. That, um, so did they, they don't have the books yet, huh? Did they, they didn't open up, it's still closed? Okay. That Ibn al-Mubarak was once accompanied <coughs> on a journey by a man of bad character and treated him with forbearance and politeness. When they parted, Ibn al-Mubarak wept. Upon being asked why he did so, he replied, I weep out of compassion for him. I have left him, but his character is still with him and has not departed from his company. Look at the way people were. Now, we don't even cry about our own states. When was the last time that we cried about the state of someone else? Yet he weeped for him because this person's character was still with him because these are people... The more and more you realize the realities of things, the more and more you're impacted by things that you see. The more and more you realize the severity of things. Junaid said, Four things lift up a man to the highest degrees, even should his knowledge and works be insubstantial. SubhanAllah. Al-hilm, forbearance, right? Mod uh, uh, mildness. at as he translates here as modesty, which is one of the meanings of, you can tra modesty uh, has the connotation of freedom from conceit or vanity, right? And modesty also has uh, the connotation of propriety in one's dress, speech, and conduct. So modesty can have both those meanings. Uh, but tawalda is generally translated as humility. So humility or modesty. So they have forbearance, modesty, as generosity, and husnul khuluq, and good character. By these things, faith is made complete. And this is why that you'll see that the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who were many, some say 124,000, others say 160,000, others say you can't 
mention a specific number of how many the companions were because they spread out throughout the land. You don't know exactly how many they were. But how many of them had memorized the Quran? How many of them were scholars? How many of them, only seven of them, even narrated more than 1,000 hadith of our Prophet? I said. Then what about all these other companions that we understand that our Prophet I said, testified that the best, of pe the best of generations was his generation? So how do we understand that then? This is how we understand it. That they were all people of character. They were all people of sifat. Even though they might not have had a lot of uh, works, even though they might not have had a lot of knowledge, right? They are people of sifat. And to prove that, one time someone came into uh, the uh, gathering of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you want to see something, see a man from paradise, then look at so and so. And the companions saw this man that came into the gathering. And Abdullah bin Omar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, that he wanted to see the Prophet I said, just bore witness that this man was from paradise, right? I want to see what is behind this man. Why would the Prophet have done that? So he went to visit him, and he lived on the outskirts of Medina, and he stayed with him for three days. And he didn't see any extra special worship, he didn't see a lot of knowledge. He couldn't understand, like, why would the Prophet so I said him, have bore witness like this when this man appears to be a very normal person? You know, he prays his prayers and doesn't, it just seems like a normal Muslim. Right? And then he, there's a conversation where he uh, explained to him what he had done and why he'd come to stay with him and so forth. He said, I can't think of anything except that every time that I go to sleep at night, right, that any grudge that I have in my heart for a Muslim, I take it out of my heart. So I don't sleep at night having a grudge or anything in my heart towards any Muslim. Allah Akbar, that's a sifa. That's an attribute. That's a character trait. Right? He didn't have a lot of knowledge or action. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi testified that that individual right, was going to be from the people of paradise. Attributes. Character. al kittani said, Sufism is good character. At tasawwuf khuluq. So anyone who improves your character has improved your Sufism also. Right? At tasawwuf khuluq. Faman zada alayk fil khuluq, zada alayk fil tasawwuf. That what it means is all of tasawwuf is about character. And so whoever surpasses you in good character has surpassed you in tasawwuf. Omar said, radiallahu anhu, Deal with the common people on the basis of good character and differ with them with your deeds. Right? Because when you're with common people who don't know a lot of the intricate etiquettes of the Sharia, that you're going to find a lot of times they'll have bad adab, they'll have bad character, they'll do things that you need to bear. Yahya bin Mu'al said that bad character is a sin in the presence of which abundant good deeds are of no avail. Why good character is a virtue in the presence of which many sins can do no harm. This is also related to what we talked about, the woman who prayed and fasted, right? But when the Prophet sent him, was told that she harmed others with her, her neighbors with her tongue, the Prophet said there's no good in her. She's from the people of the fire. Ibn Abbas was asked, what is nobility? What is karam? And he replied, that which God has mentioned in his mighty book, in Akramukum and Allahum, assuredly the most noble of you in God's sight are the most pious. And he was asked, What is good lineage? And he replied, The man with the best character has the best lineage. And it's been said that every building has a foundation. And the foundation of Islam, the edifice of Islam, is good character. La ilaha illallah. Where are the Muslims with the realities of their deen? The 1.3 billion Muslims in the world, where are the Muslims to the reality? This is the reality of their deen. This is the reality. Where are we, first and foremost? And where are the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad from this prophetic inheritance of character? Where are we? That if people would see these realities of the deen in us, that they most likely wouldn't say what they say about us. But we've fallen short. 
We've forgotten about the true nature of our deen. We've forgotten about the importance of these type of things. We've forgotten about the principles that are behind things. Such that, you know, we call in sick to work and we're not sick. Which is a kedab, which is a lie. Such that we, uh, you know, some people uh, will, you know, lie on their tax forms and say that kada kada kada, just to get a tax break. Other people at Ali Bilal who are really deep into it will, you know, or into the mortgage business, you know, people that have already died, you know, get loans for people that have already died, which is not only riba, but kadib on top of a whole bunch of other things. Like, where are Muslims from these character, from character? Where are Muslims from understanding the importance of character? And that's what these first chapters are supposed to do. Then in order for you to have action, you first have to have ilm and knowledge. And so in these first two chapters, what he wants it to drive home to us is the importance of character and how integral it is a part of our deen. This person who's saying this statement here is saying that everything has, every building has a foundation and the foundation of Islam is good character. Ibn Atta said that those who have reached high degrees have done so only through good character. The perfection of which has been attained solely by the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the nearest of all creatures to God, and those who follow in his footsteps through assuming the traits of his, his noble character, to the extent that someone is close to the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will be to the extent that they're close to Allah. To the extent that they have good character, will be to the extent that they're close to the messenger of Allah. It's a direct correlation, it's a direct, it's an equation, there's a direct relation between the two. And if we get closer and closer that we get to Rasulullah, because he's the door of Allah, the closer we get to our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, and then in, he mentions a new chapter, an exposition, a bayan, of the true nature, the haqiqah of good and bad character. No. The people have discoursed upon the true nature of good character and upon what it constitutes, but have in fact treated only the fruit, the thamara, which it bears and not its reality. They have not grasped the entirety of its fruit, of which everyone has mentioned that which occurred to him and came to his mind. Never have they directed their attention towards providing a definition for it or a discussion of its nature which takes, which takes all of its fruits into account, into account in a detailed and comprehensive fashion. So he's saying that in terms of character that you'll find a number of different of the great scholars mentioned that good character is such and such and now he's going to mention examples. Good character is such and such a thing. What he's saying is is that they're mentioning some of the fruits of having good character. Meaning if someone possesses good character, these are the type of examples that manifest upon his limbs and upon his character. But what he's saying is, is that no one's given before him a comprehensive definition about what the reality of good character is. And he said even those people that mentioned specific some of the fruits of having good character, that they didn't even mention all of the fruits that come from a person that has this good character. So for example, the saying of Al-Hasan that good character is a cheerful, cheerful face, busted wudge, that magnanimity, being generous, yani badl al-nada, wa kaf al adha and doing no harm. This is what Al-Hasan said. And Al-Wasati said, it is that one should not argue with anyone or be argued with by anyone because of one's firm knowledge of God, exalted is he, completely avoiding argumentation. Not only not arguing with other people, right? Not putting yourself in a position to be argued with, right? Because of one's knowledge of God, meaning once you realize that Allah sees you and that wa inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, we belong to Allah and we are returning to Allah, that you don't have time for argumentation. You don't have time to put yourself in situations where people are going to waste your time about talking about things and just, just wanting to argue and because of the disease that's in their heart. And he said, Shah al-Kirmani said, that it is to do no harm and to endure, and to endure harm instead. Right? To don't harm anyone else, but when other people harm you, that you endure it and you bear it. And Wasati once said, it is to please people secretly and in public, to do things that people like. 
Abu Uthman said it is to be content, have rida, with the will of God. When Sahal al-Tustari was asked about good character, he replied, its least degree is tolerance, right? Ihtimal, bearing other people's wrongs. Tark al mukafa seeking no reward. Compassion and pity for the wrongdoer, ajeeb, right? The zalim. And asking God's pardon for him. He's saying that's the least degree of good character. If there's a zalim, right? And that's something that you always know. A zalim, and someone who's oppressor, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love the zalimin, obviously. Allah doesn't love the people of oppression or of tyranny or of wrongdoing. But no matter how much wrongdoing someone does, you have to distinguish between hating that wrongdoing that he's doing and him and his essence. That no matter how much someone does wrong, right, you still have to have doors of mercy in your heart opened up to that individual. Even if you're speaking about how this person's a zalim, He's pressed so many people and so forth, right? You still have to have compassion and pity and asking God's pardon for him on top of all that. He's saying that's the least bit. That's the least stage of good character. Then what is the, the end of the good character? And he once said, it is that you do not direct accusations at your Lord concerning your sustenance. That you don't, you, you trust in him in terms of what he gives you. And that you trust in him, being confident that he shall provide that which he has guaranteed you. It is that you obey him, but do not transgress against him in any of your affairs, both in that which is between you and him, and that which takes place between you and mankind. And Ali, Karram Allah has said, Good character consists in three traits. Avoiding that which is forbidden, seeking that which is permitted, and being generous to one's family. That al Hussein ibn Mansur al-Hallaj said, it is that you should be unaffected by the harshness of mankind after having beheld the truth. That once you are a spiritual person whose heart's in the divine presence, right, that you'll see everyone, no matter what anyone does, is that you'll see it being from Allah. You won't see it being from that individual. And seeing it being from Allah is one of the keys of having good character. Because then you won't get caught up in the element of the nafs, right? Such that if someone harms you in some way and there's, the nafs is still there, the inclination of the nafs is, right, is to right, just do that thing back. But if you arise above that state where you saw this was from Allah despite the ignorance of this individual, right, to test you in some way, right, then khalas, there's a clean slate down there. You're not going to feel those normal things that come to the nafus that people... Uh, normally have. Aywa. That finally, uh, Abu Sa'id al Kharraz said that it is that you should have no concern, himma, but for God. There are many statements of this nature, but they all treat of the fruit of good character, not its essence. Neither do they succeed in even in encompassing all of these fruits, since to unveil its true nature is more important than to cite various sayings on the matter. We shall proceed with our discourse as follows. Creation, khaluk, and character, khuluk, are two expressions which may be used together. For, we say, for example, that so-and-so is good in his creation. Hasan al he has a good <coughs> physical stature. And his character, wad khuluk, meaning that both his inward and outward aspects are good. Creation, khaluk, refers to the external. And character, khuluk, to the internal form. Now man is composed of a body which perceives with ocular vision, sight, and a spirit and soul, a ruh and a nafs, which perceive with inner sight, which is basira. Each of these things has an aspect and a form which is either ugly or beautiful. Right? The sight and the inner aspect of the human being, uh, or the inner aspect of the human being, has a form which is either ugly or beautiful. Furthermore, the soul which perceives with inner sight is of greater worth than the body which sees with ocular vision, which is why God has stressed its importance by ascribing it to himself in his statement, I shall create a man from clay, inni khaliqun basharan min teen. And when I have fashioned him, fa'idha sawaituhu, and have breathed into him something of my spirit, wa nafakhtu fihi min ruhi, 
Then fall ye down before him in prostration. Fakarulahu sajidin. In this state, he in this text he states that the body is ascribed to ascribed to clay, right? Ini khalukun basharan, right? Min tin. I'm created man from clay. But this, that the spirit is ascribed to the Lord of the worlds. When he talks about the ruh, though, right? Wanafakhtofihi min ruhi. And I breathe into him of my spirit. Spirit and soul in this context referring to this self same thing uh, the nafs and the ruh. A trait of character, then, is a firmly established condition of the soul from which actions proceed easily without any need for thinking or forethought. Everyone should write that down. That is the definition of good character. That a trait of character then is a firmly established condition of the soul from which actions proceed easily without any need for thinking or forethought. If this condition is disposed towards the production of beautiful and praiseworthy deeds, as they are acknowledged by the law, the sharia, and the intellect, it is, it is termed a good character trait. Right? So the way it's determined, whether it's a good character trait, is by what? By the sharia and the intellect. And the intellect, it is termed a good character. If, however, ugly acts proceed from it, the condition is known as bad character trait. We describe this condition as firmly established, rasikha, because the character of a man who gives some of his wealth rarely and under transient circumstances cannot be described as generous, since the attribute has not become firmly established and fixed in his soul. Right? As our Prophet said, al ilm bit ta'allam wal hilm bit Right? Knowledge is through seeking and striving to seek that knowledge. And hilm, forbearance, is by forcing yourself time and time again to have forbearance until you attain it. And striving time and time again until you attain it. So there's tahallum, is before you're going to be a person who's halim, right? you have to tahallum, you have to try to become halim. Unless you are blessed, and some people are, to have the be forbearing even naturally from their character, which some people are. Uh, and likewise with the other characters, character traits, that if it's still hard for someone to give out, right, he's not determined to be Kareem yet, right, he's still seeking to become Kareem. So what he's saying here now is, is that as long as someone is still striving and only gives out, for instance, his wealth in some occasions or rarely, that person's not Kareem, right, rather the, the Kareem is someone who has just become easy for him. He just gives out without even thinking twice about it. Right? If there's a need or a situation comes up to show that generosity, before he even thinks about it, he gives it out. And he adopts that character trait. Now, as we specified, such acts must proceed from a man easily and without thinking, since the man who, with forethought and effort, makes a show of generosity or remaining silent and angry is not to be called generous or mild of character. Right? Because someone that, that uh, who, who uh, he could, there's other ulterior motives that someone could have uh, with forethought and with effort, such as that, uh, making a show, doing it for ostentation so that people praise him. Right? And likewise in the state of remaining silent when angry. So he said four things are thus involved. And look at the, the power of the intellect of Imam Ghazali is just incredible. When he gets down to these things, and it's just, he, 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 the way he has the ability to break down the deen and to leave it to, for, so people can understand it. Right? It's why one of the, uh, they say they have a tradition of saying in the place that I studied in, in Yemen that Imam al-Ghazali ghazal al-Sharia. That Imam Ghazali spun the Sharia, meaning that if the Sharia was like uh, cotton, right, that he spun it into thread, right, that he spun it. And he said that Imam al Sha'arani khayyataha. Uh, Imam al Sha'arani wove it, right. So Imam Ghazali put it into thread, right, meaning that 
he put it so that you can get your hands on it. If it's still, like if someone gave you some cotton, and they say, can you please sew me a shirt? <laughs> and what are you going to do with a bunch of cotton? Right? It's got to be on a spool first. It's got to be thread. And then he, remember Sha'rani, after he was given the thread, that he weaved it. Right? He turned it into cloth. Right? And they say about Imam al-Haddad, right? Qasaraha wa hadaha. That Imam al-Haddad, right, shaped it into clothes. Right? And, and it's indicating that these are three of the scholars that in the particular tradition that I studied in, that they encourage people to focus upon reading their books. Uh, one, because of the way that these three imams joined between uh, outward and inward knowledge. Uh, Imam al-Sha'rani, that he, he, he mentions uh, that uh, he was given an immense amount of outward knowledge. He was, Allah Ta'ala showed him the proofs of all of the four different madhahib and some of the earlier madhahib that uh, became extinct and he showed them not only the legal rulings of those different madhahib but also how they came to their legal rulings which is an entirely different thing right it's easy now to say right okay I learned now in the Hanafi madhab that they pray witr three rakas Right, and they do the qunut in winter, silently. Type. Why did Imam Abu Hanifa decide to pray the winter three, and not like two and one, like the Shafis and the Madikis? Why did he decide to do the qunut in the winter, whereas the Shafis do it and the Madikis at Fajr? Right. Why did he do it before making rukur, when the Shafis do it after rukur? Right. Why did he? How did he come to that ijtihad? And he said he was given the knowledge of that, of how each mujtahid came to not only the rulings that he was given, but how, they, how he came to the rulings, and on top of all that, the wisdoms behind them. And hopefully if Allah Ta'ala extends our life, that's something that we want to do maybe next quarter. Uh, this book by Imam Ghazali, or Imam Sha'ani, titled al mizan al kubr I've mentioned it uh, more than once because it's of immense benefit. Uh, for an individual in his own path to Allah, uh, but also, especially in terms of a, uh, when we're living here together with people from so many different backgrounds and people coming from different places, that it's a very important to have a basic understanding of this so that we don't let unnecessary things lead us to arguing when there shouldn't be, that's not a proper place for argumentation. And so that, uh, that's one of the reasons that they... Uh, used to like the books of these three is because of their outward knowledge combined with their in knowledge of the inward sciences and uh, for other reasons as well but one of the things that Imam Ghazali did have this ability to do was present these realities in a deen in a coherent way for people to understand the same with Imam al-Sha'rani and the same with Imam al-Haddad and if you look at the books of Imam al-Haddad that's why they're some of the most beneficial books is along with the other two that were mentioned is because it yajma'uka ala al-maqsood wa ala Allah. Right? These books will gather your heart upon what's truly important. These books gather you and take you to Allah. Right? And it's not to mention that there's not other important books. There is. But once you've learned your fard'aim and your individual obligations of theology and jurisprudence and character, then once you move on after that, these are the most important books that you have to read on a daily basis. Like we're doing this once a week. That we were actually supposed to read a book like this, right, on a daily basis. Even if it only be one or two pages. And the reason is because it reminds us of some of these things that are so easy to forget. And if we don't remind ourselves that we'll, we, we just, we, the human being was called the insan because he has nisyan, because he forgets. And so, uh, uh, these books gather you upon the maqsood of, of life. And if you look at Imam Haddad's books, they're abridged. That it's very difficult for us to access the longer books of the previous scholars. And so, uh, Imam Haddad had the ability to abridge. That's why he said, qassaraha. Right? He abridged it with hadaha. And like, you know, formed it. And so, in the example here of, uh, of, of, that was given in terms of cloth. So, he says here, that four things are thus involved in this aspect of character that we're dealing with. Firstly, 
There is the doing of something beautiful or ugly. The fi'l, the actual doing of the act. Secondly, that you have the ability to act. Right, which is the, the qudra, alihima. Thirdly, you have the cognition of the act, which is the knowledge related to it, the intellectual aspect. And fourthly, a condition of the soul by which it inclines to one side or the other, in which renders the beautiful or the ugly thing easy to do. And I'll explain what that means. Therefore, character is not the same as action. There are many people of generous character who do not make donations from their wealth either because they have none or by reason of some other obstacle. So just because someone doesn't have wealth, right, doesn't mean they're not generous, right? They could be much more generous or because of some obstacle. And I think we mentioned in the prophetic characteristics class last quarter, the story of one of the imams uh, in Hadramaut, Imam Abu Bakr al-Adni, who was known for being extremely generous that there was a scholar that came to visit him and he asked what kind of meat the scholar likes and he, and he happened to like the heart of the animal. I know it sounds a little strange but and they don't waste a lot of meat. They don't waste a lot of the food like we do here. Like I only can eat the breast or the, I can only eat the arm. And, you know, there they eat, mashallah. Yani, they, they, actually the delicatessen is the head. And um, so the scholar came to visit Imam Bakr and Adni and he happened to particularly like the heart. And this imam slaughtered 50 goats and just took out the heart and served the scholar a plate of heart, 50 hearts. And the scholar comes and sees it. La ilaha illallah. Right? This is israf. Right? You, it's not permissible to you know, uh, spend your wealth like this way and to waste your money like this. And uh, Imam Abu Bakr al-Adni uh, uh, said to him through his kashf, he didn't say that outwardly, he read his heart. And he said, that he says, as far as the remainder of the meat, he said, don't worry, that we have plenty of people that we're supporting, we're not, it's not going to go to waste, we're going to distribute that amongst the poor. Right? And he says that as far as uh, you, he says that you're a person of knowledge. Right? And I, I hear what I did by slaughtering 50 goats and giving you the heart which you like. I've honored knowledge and you've told me that I've done something that I shouldn't be doing. He said, but despite all that, he said, you think this is generous? He said, my brother who lives in Tarim, right, is even more generous than me. Right? And this, is like, this person is like, la, 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 la. how could you be more generous than that? <laughs> 50 goats. And, he, you know, and um, uh, so they go back to Tarim. Uh, he goes back to Tarim to seek out his brother, Hussein. Uh, and he goes to visit Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein lives in a small house, and he goes to visit him. And he, it's lunchtime, and no lunch comes. He spends the rest of the day with him. Dinner time comes. He comes out and he breaks a piece of bread and gives him half a loaf of bread. And he's confused. He's like, "Wait a sec. He told me that he's more generous than, than he is. How could this be? He just gave me a half a loaf of bread. But that's all he's eaten the entire day." And uh, uh, his brother, again, read his heart and said to him, he said, my brother, I oh, know, then he went back to him. And uh, he said to him, yeah, he's more generous than me. He says, as far as me, I have a lot of wealth. The percentage of the wealth that I gave you, the what I gave you compared to how much I have is a very small percentage. He said, that loaf of bread that my brother gave you, that's all he had. So he gave you 50% of his wealth. Right, so he said, which one, who's more generous? Someone who gives 50% of their wealth or someone who gives 2% you know, of their wealth? And obviously, someone who gives 50% of their wealth. So what he's saying here is character is not the same as action. You could have someone who's generous but just doesn't have money to give or there's some other obstacle preventing him from giving. Just as there are people whose character is avaricious, right, who are miserly or greedy, but who distribute their wealth for some motive or other, or out of ostentation in the interest of their reputation. And so that person is not considered to be generous if the reasons behind his giving aren't in accordance to the Sharia. Neither is it the same as ability. Right? What? Character. Character is not also the same as the ability. 
since this does not differ whether it is ascribed to withholding or giving or to the opposite two opposite traits ability is ability it's not related to that character every man has been created by to be by disposition capable of withholding and giving yet this does not necessarily bring about an avaricious or a generous character right we, the possibility to give or withhold is in each one of us right but that ability that we've been given right is not character in and of itself because character is something different nor yet is it the same as one's cognition of the act for cognition pertains to the beautiful and the ugly in the same way instead it is to be identified with the fourth sense namely the condition through which the soul prepares itself for the issuing of giving or withholding so he says there's four things here there's the actual doing of the act the actual giving of the charity for instance right there's the ability to act there's the ability within each human being to withhold or to give then there's the cognition of the act you couldn't give unless you had the intellectual understanding about giving first right and fourthly a condition by the soul by which it inclines to one side or the other that it actually does those things previously mentioned so what his point here is he wants to hit the head the hammer on the hit the nail on the head about what actually is character character is not the actual act nor is it the ability to do the act nor is it the cognition of the act what character is is the actual doing of it in the inclination of the soul to do it that's what the essence of character is their character therefore is a term for the condition and inner aspect of the soul just as one's external appearance can never be beautiful when the eyes are beautiful but not the nose the mouth and the cheek for all the features must be beautiful if one's outward aspect is to be beautiful also so too there exist things for a number which must all be beautiful if one is to be possessed of a beautiful character which will obtain when these four things are settled balanced in the correct proportion to each other he's going to give us now he's given us the definition of character now he's told us about what the reality of character is now he's telling us that just as we have outward beauty in terms of our face which our eyes nose mouth and cheeks all have to be beautiful to be considered someone to be considered beautiful that if someone has beautiful eyes but their nose is broken or if someone has uh, beautiful eyes and nose and cheeks but he has gashes in his lips or his lips are, are, are you know are swollen uh, because he's been hit or whatever right beauty is a balance of all those different things so he said likewise with character there's also four just as the face there's four the inner character the inner face there's four what are these these are what are called the rational faculty the quwwat al ilm the irascible faculty right which is the quwwat al ghadab the appetitive faculty which is the quwwat al shahwa and the faculty which effects a just equilibrium between these three things now i know this might be a little much to uh, understand right at first uh, time you're hearing it but he's going to give examples at a later time is going to clarify it so these four faculties the first the rational faculty is sound and good when it is easily able to discriminate that is to distinguish honesty honesty from lies in speech truth from falsehood and questions of belief in beauty from ugliness in actions when this faculty is sound it bears fruit in the form of wisdom which is the ras the chief of the good traits of character in regarding which god has said and whoever who, who and whosoever is granted wisdom woman uti al hikmata وَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا has truly been granted abundant good so he said that this rational faculty is the ability to uh, determine truth from lies in terms of one's speech truthhood and falsehood in questions of belief and beauty from ugliness in terms of actions this is knowledge because if you don't have knowledge about what is beautiful and ugly how are you going to know what's beautiful and ugly if you don't have knowledge of right and wrong how are you going to do what's right if you don't know what's wrong to avoid and so knowledge is the first step in terms of understanding these things and that's as i say true wisdom is not determining right from wrong 
right? That's fairly easy to do for most people. But true wisdom is in determining, right, the lesser of a two evils or the greater of two goods. Because if you're in, a lot of times you're in situations where it's not clear. There's certain preventatives where your normal paradigm for dealing with the actions that you do, right, falls apart because there's no good outcome, right? But what do you do in that event? And there's no good outcome. There's two bad outcomes, right? You have to choose the least worst of the two. Right? Or, in a positive sense, if you have two opportunities to do two good things, you're invited to give two different speeches at two different places at the same time, which do you do? Right? Which one's more important? Right? Which one is going to be more beneficial? Which people are more in need? And so forth and so on, and all of the other considerations that you'll use to make your decision. Regarding the irascible faculty, this is sound when its movements lie within the bounds required by wisdom. Likewise, okay, uh, the irascible facility is what he calls quot al ghadab It's the faculty of controlling one's anger. And so you have the knowledge, anger, and then the desires, to put it in simple terms. He calls it the appetitive faculty, right? Your shahwa. And so that it's, this is something that is in the human being, anger. Now, we're not supposed to erase anger. We're supposed to control our anger. Our anger. And so what he's saying here is that this is a faculty within the human being. When it's unbalanced, when it's imbalanced, it's going to lead to a whole bunch of other things, whether in whatever extreme it's in. But when it's balanced, what is the balance of this mean? Is, is that it, it is sound within the movements, lie within the bounds required by wisdom, which is knowledge. So your anger is in control by your wisdom, right? Meaning that there's times where you let your anger loose, right? Because you have to. If, you, if, you're, if you, someone's attacking your child or your wife, right? And if you don't have anger, how are you going to defend them, right? You have to be angry in that moment, right? But be controlled, right? When you see a action that is impermissible in the Sharia. You have to have anger there, but you have to be controlled, right? And this is one of the, this is why this is so important, because this is one of the key things that you see in all these events that are taking place in these fitan that are happening in the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that how are Muslims responding? If people don't know how to control their irascible facility, faculty, then how are they going to respond in an appropriate way, right? You might know right from wrong, but you don't have the ability to control yourself. Or that you have the ability to control yourself, but you've misunderstood right from wrong. Both are ways of going astray. And so what, what is balanced is to have a, an understanding of what to do, and then to have that wisdom direct your anger, such that you don't let your anger cause you to do ignorant acts, like attacking innocent people that are worshiping in a church because of something that the Pope said, as an example. Now, likewise, the appetite of faculty is sound and good when it is under the command of wisdom, by which I mean the command of law. Likewise, in terms of one's appetite, in terms of one's desire, right? That, وَرُبَّ مَخْمَصَةٍ شَرُّ مِنَ تُخَمِي is Imam Busseri says, that sometimes that undereating is even worse than overeating. Like most of the time you hear people talking about how bad overeating is, Sometimes undereating is even worse, but it could put you in a worse state by, by undereating. And so the point is, is to be balanced. And again, it's about wisdom. And having your appetitive faculty be in according to wisdom. Right? If, if you know uh, that you're going to have a long travel ahead of you, and you're not going to eat for a long period of time, right, you have to prepare. That's one of the wisdoms of suhoor. Eat the suhoor. Right? Eat a pre-dawn meal, because in it is barakah. Allah and His angels prey upon the mutasahirin, the people that are eating a pre-dawn meal. This is something we should bring to mind while we're eating our suhoor, that one, our Prophet ﷺ used to eat it, sunnah. Two, he said, in it is barakah. Right? So we should know in it is barakah. Three, that Allah and the angels prey upon the people that are eating a pre-dawn meal. Right? We should, if we bring that to heart while we're eating suhoor, will change suhoor into a form of worship for our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And so it has to be in balance that you don't cause yourself to be extremely hungry, nor do you overeat. It's in a balance with wisdom. And what he means by wisdom here, by which I mean the command of the law in the intellect, the sharia in the intellect. This is why the sharia is such a mercy, because it clarifies to you the limits. It clarifies to you what you should and not do, and do and not do. It clarifies to you the, uh, it clarifies to you the range of actions that you can do. Sometimes the sharia will clarify for you, you could do this from here to here and actions in between. And this is definitely better than this, but they're all permissible. And the intellect. In reality, the Sharia doesn't go against the intellect. In reality. In reality, the Sharia does not go against the intellect. That there's wisdoms behind everything. Some of the wisdoms we know, and some of the wisdoms we don't know. Right? I was just uh, pulled, I was looking for a book, and I was just pulled it off the shelf, and hopefully get to get to, get to it. It's a book by Al-Hakim al-Tarmadi, right, where he talks about all of the ilal and the reasons behind a number of the acts of worship that we do, from the takbir, from purification to the takbir to ihram to fasting to the mu'amalat and all, riba and others and, and, and so forth. That there's wisdoms uh, behind everything. And uh, now... La ilaha illallah... As for the faculty to affect a just equilibrium, right? The faculty uh, by which we balance between these different faculties. It is this which sets desire and anger under the command of the intellect and the law. Right? And this is related to the human being and his ability to actually do what is being mentioned. For the intellect has the status of a guiding counselor, a nasih and mushir, right? That, uh, uh, that the guiding counselor, while the faculty for just equilibrium is the actualizing power. It's the ability by which we actually do things. And has the status of something which carries out its orders. The same command is carried out by the irascible facility, which is like a hunting dog, which needs to be trained before its unleashing and restraint can conform to orders rather than to the outbursts of the soul's desires. So next time you, you know that your neighbor's dog is rough roughing and bothering you and barking, that just think about, you know, that dog might be annoying in the Shafi Madhab, it's Nejus, also in the Hanafi Madhab, but, right, your soul might be more dog-like than that dog, right, if you're just barking and it's out of control. Right, you might be more like that dog than that very dog in reality. If you can't control your anger, that's what you're like, is a dog. Even worse than a dog. Because a dog is just being a dog. You're a human being that's been given a brain. You're not supposed to be acting like a dog. So he said, which is like a hunting dog, okay? In turn, desire, so that's in terms of the anger, the faculty of anger. Desire is like a horse which one rides during the chase, and which is sometimes tractable and well-disciplined, right? It's been trained, and sometimes endeavors to bolt. Right? And that, that what can I do to, Imam Abu Sayyidi says, to restrain the outbursts of the soul? like someone tries to restrain a horse that is starting to bolt, right? The likeness of our nafs is like a horse when it's untrained. A wild horse that just likes to just, as soon as someone gets on it and wants to get it to do something, it just bolts like that. Therefore, the man in whom these characteristics are sound and balanced is possessed of a good character in all circumstances. So the key is in these four things. If we can balance ourselves in these four things, Every situation that we're in, we'll respond to it in the way that we're supposed to respond to it. And we'll be with good character. The man in whom some of them are balanced and not others in good of character and respect. Excuse me. The man in whom some of, some of them are balanced and not others is good of character and respect of his balanced traits alone. 
in the manner of a man only some of whose facial features, facial features are handsome. The irascible faculty, when sound and balanced, right, this is again related to anger, is called courage, shuja'ah. Similarly, the appetitive faculty, when sound and balanced, is known as temperance. And the definition that they gave for temperance in Webster's is a habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites or passions. Right? Temperance, ifa. Should the former faculty lose its balance, meaning that of the uh, related to anger, and incline towards excess, it is called recklessness, tahawwur. While should incline towards weakness and insufficiency, it is termed cowardice, juban, and languor, right, which is like weakness of body or mind, khur. Should the appetitive faculty move to the point of excess, it is called cupidity, right, which is like strong desire and lust, shara. While, while if it should incline to defect, it is known as indifference, jamud. That's not something praiseworthy in Islam, is that not have any desire at all. Right? That rather, our Prophet said, <laughs> Not that you don't have desire, but none of you truly believe until his desire is in conformant with what I've brought. Right? So it's, you're not going to erase your desire. Right? But what you should desire is what Allah desires. Right? So you should desire prayer and love prayer. You should desire righteousness and love righteousness. You should desire istiqama and uprightness and love uprightness. Right? That you should desire and love showing your servitude and servanthood to Allah. That you should desire that and, li and like that. The mean is the praiseworthy thing and it is this which constitutes virtue. While the two extremes are blameworthy vices. Right? Wasat and thus we've made you a middle day, a middle way nation. That osat and nas is, it means middle, right, between two extremes, but also means the best. Osat has a meaning, connotation of afdal, of being the best. Right? Ihdina sarat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. The straight path, right, which is finer than a hair and sharper than a sword. Right? If you're on a path, there's two sides of the path. Right? You could fall off on the right, or you could fall off on the left. What is praiseworthy is balance. That's why you see in the Messenger of Allah وسلم, a perfect balance. And we see in the way that the scholars and people of Allah went to extremes to overcome certain aspects of their soul, that they only went to those extremes to maintain balance. Right? And this is why that uh, uh, one time uh, a lady came to the presence of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani and that he had his uh, disciples that in their eat, they used to eat very simple food. And her mother, being a good mother she was, was concerned about her Son's eating like, and she came in, and she comes into the gathering. She comes to call Jilani, and there's all these different types of food and chicken and all these type of things. And, and her mother's like, you know, why do you, you know, my son is eating simplest of foods, and look at you all are indulging in all this food. And Sheikh Abdul Qadir said to her, he said that if I would let him eat like this now, it would harm him. He said, as for me, right, I don't have any, I don't turn to any of this stuff. It doesn't harm me. Meaning that you reach a point that after you've put yourself into a state of control, right, you can enter into the dunya later on, right? That it's not that you're never supposed to enter into dunya, right? But you're, the key is to enter into dunya, right? Being in the divine presence of being in the, having your heart being the divine presence. That's the whole key. And you don't do that at first except through going against your lower soul. And so balance, it's about balance ultimately. And that's why you see is that our Prophet وسلم, right, was the most balanced of people. Right? How many rakats did he used to pray every night for Tahajjud? Right? What was the way that he used to distribute his time? Look at his life. 
and how balanced it was, right? He didn't have to initially strive to maintain that balance, right? Not only was he created with that balance, Sallallahu said them, he was the determining balance for balance for every human being that's ever walked the earth, right? He was the essence of balance, right? And that's why that some of the scholars say, I believe it's at Hassan al Basri, when Allah says, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqeem, right? Guide me to the straight path. They say the Sirat al Mustaqeem is Muhammad. He is the Sirat al Mustaqeem. He is the straight path. And there's an indication of that also when Allah says, Wa anna hadha sirati mustaqeeman. Hadha is an ism ishara. Hadha al kitab. This book. Right? And it's as if Allah is saying, Anna hadha, right, referring to the Messenger of Allah, sirati, my straight path. Right? He's referring to the Prophet Sallallahu in a tafsir ishari. This, anna hadha, and this is my straight path, referring to the Messenger of Allah. So that he is the essence of balance. Rather, he is the way balance is determined. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Now, The faculty for just equilibrium, however, when in disorder, has no extremes of excess and defect, rather has one opposite, which is tyranny. As for wisdom, exceeding the bounds in its regard by using it for corrupt ends is called swindling and fraud, while its insufficient application is termed stupidity, bala. Again, it is the mean to it is uh, again it is the mean to which the word Wisdom is applied. Therefore, the fundamental good traits of character are four in number. Wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. And so what he's saying is these three faculties of courage, temperance, and wisdom, that they all have two extremes. And each extreme will lead to a number of uh, blameworthy characteristics, which he's going to talk about. As for the faculty of equilibrium, right, which is related to our choices that we make in all of this, is that there's only there's one of two things. Either it's balanced or it's in a state of disorder. Right? And this gets back into the nature of the human being. Wal asri in insana fi That by time human being is in loss. Illa Except those people who believe and do righteous deeds, right? And enjoin one another to patience, to, uh, to truth and patience. So meaning that if you don't occupy yourself with good, you will fall into evil. That if you don't actively and you're not proactive in balancing and maintaining this equilibrium of these other three faculties, right? It will be in a state of disorder. You have to have that output. If you're going to go up, right, you need to have, you need to expend energy if you're going to progress. That's all there is to it. In the same way in terms of spirituality. That the moment that you stop, right, you're falling. And that's why Abdul Hassan al-Basri said, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given the believers a raha, a repose, a, relaxing, a relaxation, any state of relaxation until they reach paradise. Right? They have no time to relax. Now, I'm going to explain that. For people coming out of a six-hour work week, what do you mean I can't relax? I have to relax. No. What it means is, is that in terms of your taqwa, you can never relax. You can't just say, you know, I've prayed now for 20 years. I think I'm just going to take a breather from praying for a few, for a few months just to get, you know, you can't do that. Right? You can't just say, you know, I've been so obedient for so long, I'm just going to commit a few sins and just relax a little bit. No, that's a mistake. That's a misunderstanding. Or you always have to maintain your taqwa every single moment you're in life. Now, that outwardly letting yourself take a vacation or relaxing, right? The human being has to relax because as we mentioned before, for anyone who attend our classes, that the nafs of the human being is like his riding beast. It's the, it's the, the nafs is what gets you from point A to point B. 
And so, if you're riding on an animal, like they did in the old days, that you can't just ride 24 hours a day, right? You have to stop at about 11 o'clock, right? Wait till the sun gets past the zenith at about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Start riding again. You have to relax, or else you're going to kill your animal. And you're going to overburden your animal. Likewise, in terms of our nafs. But the difference is, is that even when you're relaxing, it's with intention. Right? So in reality, you're not letting go of your taqwa. In reality, that you're not falling into those people that are in loss. Because you have intention behind what you're doing. What is your intention? Is that when you relax, right? like in Tarawih, in many places, after every four rakas, right, they wait for like 30 seconds to a minute. Right? To, get a, right? to regain yourself. Right? Intent in that, not to just enjoy the relaxation, Right? But to strengthen yourself when you're about to stand on prayer again. When you go on a vacation, when you relax and, 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 and do things to, uh, uh, that are permissible, right? then do it with the intention of strengthening yourself so when you come back to ibadah, right? that you're focused. And that's the whole point, is that when you do your ibadah, is that you're focused. And someone who exhausts himself night and day and never relaxes, and thus it causes him to not concentrate his ibadah. Better than him is an individual who actually stops worshipping and does a form of permissible thing and then gets back to worship with concentration. That's even better. Now, so he said, therefore, the fund fundamental good traits of character are four in number, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. By wisdom we mean a condition of the soul by which it distinguishes truth from false. In all volitional acts, the acts that human has a, uh, a, a choice to do. By justice, a condition in potency, in the soul by which it controls the expansion and contraction of anger, and desire is directed by wisdom. By courage, we refer to the subjugation of the irascible faculty to the intellect. While by temperance, we have in mind the disciplining of the appetitive faculty by the intellect and the law. It is from the equilibrium of these four principles that all the good traits of character proceed. It is from the equilibrium of these four principles that all the good traits of character proceed. Since, when the intellect is balanced, it will bring forth discretion, husnit tedbir, an excellence of discernment, jodat al-dhihn, penetration of thought, thaqabat al-ra'i, al-ra'i, and correctness of conjecture, isabat al-dhan, and an understanding of the subtle implications of actions and the hidden defects of the soul. The sudden implications of actions and the hidden defects of the soul. Allahu Akbar. What is that? What does that mean? In Arabic, أَتَّفَطَّنْ لِدَقَائِكَ amal. Right? Such that people start to learn about the subtleties of things that they do. Right? What does the subtlety mean? I mean, we all know we have to pray. We all know uh, how many rakahs we pray at different times. What's an example of a subtlety of a prayer? Right? A subtlety of a prayer is, you know, why we pray. A subtlety of the prayer is, for instance, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Allah says, وَأَقِيمَ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي Right? Establish the prayer for my remembrance. Right. Our, a subtle deal, though, is, right, we all know we're supposed to remember a lot in our prayer. Aqim salata li dhikri. Right? Establish the prayer for my remembrance of you. Right? Because aqim salat, establish the prayer li dhikri. It could be for my remembrance. Right? Or at another level, it could be for my remembrance of you, which is even deeper. It's one thing to remember Allah, but it's another thing to be madhkur and to be mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an even higher thing. Another example of a subtlety uh, of prayer is related to you know, some of the afat and the pitfalls that come from praying. Such that one is related to one's sincerity. Why is one praying? Right, and testing yourself in certain situations to find out, am I praying for Allah 
Or am I praying for so-and-so who's watching on? Or am I praying for so-and-so to uh, give me such and such a thing? So there's subtleties. And this is, this is through knowledge and through the balance of wisdom, or in, of all of these, uh, that, that from the balance of, uh, int of the intellect, that this comes clear. <clears throat> when unbalanced in the direction of excess, then cunning, swindling, deception, and slyness result when the intellect's unbalanced. <clears throat> That someone who has a strong intellect and learns how to manipulate other people can do it very easy. It's very easy to manipulate people, especially when people don't realize they're being manipulated. It's a science you can study and learn how to manipulate other people. There's certain things that you can do towards other people to get certain responses from them. And if you're using it for, to get their money or because you want them to become a consumer, or you want them to do something for you, or a'udhu billahi ta'ala, right? You're setting yourself up for a extreme punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But if you use your intellect to beautify to people certain things, right? To tell them about the beauty of Islam in a way that they're going to understand, right? You know that this individual has such and such a background, and you're explaining Islam to them in a way that they understand, Right? So someone could say, that, oh, well, you're just trying to deceive them. Just tell it how it is. No. Right? You're using your intellect and realizing the reality of how Allah has created people to get a, a good result. But it's not related for anything for you. You're, you want him to turn to Allah. In the other situation, right, there's negative attributes there. You're wanting to do something for you. Wanting to oppress people. Wanting people to have control over people. And all these type of things. These are attributes of rububiya, of lordship. Anyone who seeks out those attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will break the backs of those individuals. You know, and so, so these type of people that, that try to, you know, intentionally, you know, dumb people down and intentionally do things to get a certain response from them, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deception and slyness. <clears throat> and when in that of defect and stupidity, inexperience, foolishness, heedlessness, and insanity are consequences. By inexperience, I mean insufficient experience, which is nonetheless combined with sound understanding. A man may, may be inexperienced in one matter and not in another. The difference between stupidity and insanity is that the intention of the stupid man is sound, only his means of realizing are defective. Since he is not possessed of a correct understanding of how to follow the way leading to his goal, the madman, on the other hand, chooses that which should not be chosen, so that the basis of his decisions and preferences is flawed. So that's in terms of wisdom. As for the trait of courage, this gives rise to, it means it leads to nobility, karam, intrepidity, Right, which is, uh, uh, which is nejda, right, which is resolute fearlessness, being able to help people even if there's some uh, harm that might come to you in doing so. Shahama, manliness, manliness, greatness of the soul, endurance, ihtimal, clemency, hilm, steadfastness, thabat, the suppression of rage, kadhm al Allahu Akbar, dignity, waqar, and affection. And such other praiseworthy attributes, qualities. So meaning if someone has courage, it will lead him to have all of those other attributes. As long as his courage is shown under, is, is under the direction of wisdom and the intellect. When unbalanced on the side of excess, which is recklessness, it leads to arrogance, conceit, quickness to anger, pride, <coughs> and vainglory. It went on the side of defect, defect to ig, uh, ignominy, self-abasement, cowardness, cowardice, meanness, lack of resolution, and holding oneself back from doing what is right and obligatory. As for the quality of temperance, this, rise to this gives rise to generosity, modesty, 
patience, tolerance, contentedness with one's lot, scrupulousness, wit, helping others, cheerfulness, and absence of craving. When it deviates towards excess or defect, greed, cupidity, and obscenity result. As do spite, extravagance, stinginess, ostentation, immortality, obscenity, triviality, flattery, envy, malice, self-abasement, before the rich, disdain for the poor, and so forth. We got a lot to work on. There's a lot of defects there. And subhanAllah, that's a lot to work on. But the thing is, is that if we, we have to start becoming aware of these things. And if you try to become aware and be conscious, and it's very difficult to be conscious of the acts that you do, which is why Imam Azali is going to mention, he's going to have a chapter on the four ways to determine, uh, to attain good character. But if you do everything you can do, all those four things that Imam Azali mentions, and you make dua to Allah, really turning to, to Allah, feeling impoverished before Him, Allah Ta'ala will guide you. He will, he will take it upon Himself to purify you. Right? And He loves. Well, in the law, you hibba tawawi, well, you hibba al-mutatahirin. He loves the people that are seeking purity. And He'll love you. And if Allah loves you, that it's possible that in one night you wake up in the morning and they're all gone. That's possible. That if you, and that's what they say, is that this is why that it, it was fitting that we had the prophetic characteristics class before this. Because the love of Allah and His Messenger, right, if that's in the heart of an individual, it yuhrik. It burns all blameworthy characteristics. And that's why it's one of the quickest way to attain them. If that's there, right, all these things will become easy. As long as you do what you're supposed to do and try and really try to become conscious of it. Allah will show you these aspects of yourself. And then once you start picking up on them, right, you'll still fall into them most of the time. But then you'll know, if you don't even know about them, you don't even want to make a stick far for them. And then once you know about them, you'll be able to make a stick far for them. And you'll see them coming up. And then eventually, that by knowing them, and by sometimes slipping up and making a stick far of them, and trusting in Allah, Eventually they'll all go. Eventually they'll just go. And you only have, they'll be covered up with good attributes that are in the heart. And so the fundamental no noble traits of character are therefore these four virtues, namely wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. And all other traits constitute branches of these things. A per perfectly just equilibrium in these four has been attained by no one but the emissary of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Other people are of divergent degrees of proximity and distance from them. Thus a man is close to God, exalted as he, in proportion to his closeness to his emissary, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He who combines within himself all of these traits is worthy to be a powerful king among men, whom all creatures submit to and follow in all their deeds. And likewise, he who is divested of all these qualities and acquires their opposites deserves to be exiled from the lands and all peoples. For he has become close to the accursed and banished devil. And should he be banished even as he was banished, just as the former is close to the king who was close to God, and who should therefore be emulated and drawn close to, and should be banished even as he was banished, just as the former is close to the king who was close to God, and who should therefore be emulated and drawn, and drawn close to, for the emissary of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was sent only to perfect the noble qualities of character, as he himself said, the Qur'an has referred to these qualities when describing the moral qualities of the believers. God exalted as He has said, that The believers are only those who have faith in God and His emissary. And do not then doubt. And who strive with their wealth and their selves in the path of God, such are the sincere. Therefore, faith in God and His emissary. So Imam al-Ghazali is saying that he sees these four cardinal virtues that he's talking about. He found them in this verse mentioned in the Quran. And so when Allah says that about belief, believe in Allah and His Messenger, Therefore, faith in God and His emissary, which is free from doubt, is powerful certainty. 
which is the fruit of the intellect in the utmost limit of wisdom. Wisdom. Striving with one's wealth is generosity. Striving with one's wealth is generosity, which comes from controlling the appetite of faculty. While striving, while striving with oneself is courage, which proceeds from the use of the irascible faculty under the control of the intellect and with just, and with just moderation. And in describing the companions, God exalts as he has said, I should doubt why did Kufai. Severe against the unbelievers. Will someone direct the brother to the proper Qibla? Direct the brother to the proper Qibla. Just gently turn him. Yeah. 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 Mm. <clears throat> I should doubt why Severe against the unbelievers. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice here is just gone. I need some water, but fortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> we can't drink any. No, no, no. Compassion amongst themselves, indicating that severity and compassion both have their place. Perfection is not to be found through severity or compassion <clears throat> in every situation. Thus, then, it's included the exposition of the meaning of character and how it may be good or ugly and of its pillars, consequences, and ramifications. <coughs> and, uh, excuse me. So, meaning that uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and describes the companions as this, that they're severe against the disbelie unbelievers, meaning that against the enemies of the deen. People who are enemies of the deen, they're severe against them. Or, in other words, that while they're fighting them in a, a war, that they're stern and they don't budge. Right? It doesn't mean that they're always shadid with kufar. That's not what that means. If that were the case, that why would the Prophet them address Abu Jahl? Right? Ya yeah, Abu Al-Hakam. Right? Oh, father of wisdom. The Prophet said him, because he was known as Abu al-Hakam. The Muslims gave him the name Abu Jahl, right? Because no matter, he was a wise individual in terms of worldly wise, wise uh, wisdom. But he didn't use his wisdom for the sake of Allah, so he wasn't really wise, right? But when the Prophet said him, addressed him, right? Ya yeah, Abu al-Hakam, right? Oh, Abu al-Hakam, right? in a beautiful way, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so that it doesn't mean it's a, this has this ayah has a particular connotation. Right, don't take part of the Quran and leave the other part. Because Allah says to Moses and Aaron, Musa or Harun, وَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا To Fir'aun. Right, and say you too to him, right, soft or gentle words. Fir'aun. If anyone deserved to be talked to in a shadid, harsh way, stern, it would be Fir'aun. Right? You think you're God? Leave it. Right? Allah said no. Say to him a, 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 a gentle word. Right? And he was one of the worst of the disbelievers, non-believers who ever lived. So it doesn't mean a shiddaad al-kufari. Right? Stern against the unbelievers in every situation. Right? No, this is a particular context. We have to understand the Quran in context. We have to understand in the other context too. And we have to look at the seerah of our Prophet Sallallahu and see the way that he was with other people. And how beautiful his character was. And everything has its proper space. And everything has its proper place. And the more that we study, and the more wisdom that we have, then the more that we'll be able to find that balance, uh, exactly as Imam al is saying. So may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala bless us all in the Ummah of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and spread these character traits amongst the Ummah of our Prophet Sallallahu and bless us with the attributes of wisdom, courage, temperance, uh, and justice, and bless us to be people who have their rational faculty, their irascible faculty, and their, uh, the, their, uh, their rational faculty, and the irascible faculty, and the appetitive faculty, and the faculty which controls all of those other three to be in perfect balance, insha'Allah, to the extent humanly possible, and ultimately be from those people who have good character in this world and are close to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a result. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless us all and assist us in the remaining months of Ramadan. <coughs>
was just to have increased himma and nishat and uh, want to do more ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares for the last 10 days and bless us all to reach later to al-qadr and to have all of our khas sins forgiven and to be from the suwam and the quwam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 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 wa sallam